On the 24th of May 1964, a football match in the Estadio Nacional Stadium in Lima came to a halt as the referee disallowed a goal. Shouts of anger filled the air as fans protested what they saw as an egregiously bad call. Whether the call was right or wrong, it was about to precipitate a chain of events that would lead to one of the worst disasters in the history of football. The tournament taking place in Lima in May of 1964 was an important one. It formed part of the qualifiers for the Olympics in Tokyo that summer, and would see seven South American teams facing off in a series of matches over the course of the month. At the time, football teams participating in the Olympics had to be composed entirely of amateur players. And as such, the Peruvian team had been drawn from amateur clubs in and around Lima. By the time they came to face Argentina on the 24th of May, Argentina had a considerable lead, and it looked likely to win the tournament. Peru still had a lot to play for, however. A victory against the current champions would not only be glorious in and of itself, but would also allow them a realistic chance at finishing in the top three, and perhaps even open the door to overtaking Argentina before the end of the month. There was a great deal of excitement for the match, with tickets going for twice their usual rate. This came to almost an entire day's wages per seat. But despite this high cost, the stands at the Estadio Nacional were packed, Around 50,000 spectators turned up, a number equivalent to around one-fifth of the population of Lima at the time. The first half was goalless, but in the second half Argentina scored, putting them in the lead. The tension in the crowd rose to a fever pitch as the remaining minutes ticked down, until with just six minutes left to go, a Peruvian player managed to score a last-minute, equalising goal for Peru. The goal would have brought the score to one all, but it was instantly disallowed by the referee, Angel Eduardo Passos, who ruled that the Peruvian player had committed a foul. The referee alleged that the Peruvian player had raised his foot too high in order to intercept the ball. In football, kicking above waist height can be dangerous and is often considered a foul. Whether the Peruvian player had kicked dangerously high in order to score is a matter that is debated to this day. In the moment, howls of protest filled the stadium as Peru fans made their disagreement known. Two of them even climbed over barriers and entered the pitch, intent on confronting the referee. One was Matias Rojas, a man known locally as The Bomb who had a record of invading the pitch during previous matches to contend decisions he disagreed with. He was intercepted by the police and led off the field. The other pitch invader was a man named Edilberto Cuenca. He was set upon by police and brutally beaten with batons. Police kicked and punched him and allowed police dogs to tear at his clothes, even when it became clear that he was not an immediate threat to them. On seeing the police's treatment of Edilberto, the mood of the crowd turned. Now spectators were throwing anything they could get their hands on towards the pitch. Bottles, seat cushions, coins and shoes rained down on the field. Police officers appealing for calm in the upper stands were assaulted as they tried to maintain order, with one being thrown over a barrier to fall five stories to his death, and another being strangled with his own necktie. Large numbers of spectators tore down the barbed wire-topped fences separating the stand and the pitch, and flooded out onto the field to confront the police. Sensing a turn for the worse, many spectators decided to leave, and quickly. They descended the steps to the nearest exits, only to find that three out of five exits were blocked by corrugated steel shutters, with the gate attendants who might have opened them not present to do so. The reason why these shutters were closed is not definitively known. Many sources report that the police ordered them to be closed in order to stop any rioters from leaving the scene. Others report that the gate attendants had left their posts so that they could watch the end of the match. Regardless of the reason, the gates were locked. 
As people turned back from the locked gates, the police on the pitch began firing dozens of canisters of tear gas into the crowd. This caused a panic, and thousands of people surged towards the exit tunnels, having no idea at the time that three out of five of them were dead ends. Within minutes, the tunnels leading to the closed shutters were packed tight with bodies, with people wedged in so closely that in some cases their feet were off the floor. In the seething mass of people crowded into the narrow tunnels, football fans struggled to move and even struggled to breathe. The temperature in the tunnels shot up. Many people fainted but were still kept upright by the pressure of the crowd. Some of these crushes lasted for as long as two hours. No individual person in the crowd was able to do anything to alleviate the situation. They were powerless to communicate with the people still pushing to escape the tear gas on the pitch. The only thing they could do was focus, minute by minute, on staying conscious, breathing, and waiting for the crush to alleviate. In most cases, the pressure was only alleviated when the steel shutters collapsed under the pressure of the crowd, spilling hundreds of people, both dead and living, into the streets. Even then, it would be hours in some cases before the tightly packed throng of spectators carried some of the injured and dead out into the night. While ambulances converged on the stadium, outraged football fans rioted in the surrounding streets. Private dwellings and some businesses were set on fire, including a betting shop and a tyre factory. A hundred cars were stolen, and in the chaos, 21 prisoners escaped from a nearby prison. For three hours, police fought running battles with rioters in the streets before a relative calm was restored. It was only then that the scale of the disaster sank in. Over the course of the night and throughout the next morning, a continually escalating death toll was reported. At first, it was thought that two people had died, then 10, then 20, then 50, then 100. Ultimately, the death toll would reach 328, although some contend that this number does not account for everyone who lost their life that day. While many, many people were killed in the multiple crushes at the gates of the Estadio Nacional, there were also numerous reports of people being shot by the police. Judge Benjamin Castaneda was appointed to lead an inquiry into the disaster. As the investigation progressed, he alleged that bodies were being hidden from him, and that he believed many people had been killed by police gunfire and that there was now a deliberate conspiracy to keep this from coming to light. Mr. Castaneda was ultimately fined after turning in his final report. The fine was to reflect the fact that the report was late, and to penalise his failure to attend any of the autopsies of those who had died. His report, along with his assertions that there had been an organised conspiracy, were discounted and thrown out no further investigation was made. The police officer who had made the decision to use tear gas was sentenced to 30 months in prison for his role in the disaster. The referee who had made the initial call continued to work until his retirement 10 years later. Despite the loss of life, the result of the game still stood. Argentina went on to win the tournament and represented Latin America at the Olympics in Tokyo that year. The capacity of the stadium was significantly reduced to around 42,000. A week of national mourning followed the disaster, and a state of emergency persisted in Lima for a month, with the police dealing with sporadic protests and outbreaks of crime. The Estadio Nacional continues to be an important stadium in Peru. Renovated in 2010, it is frequently used for both sporting fixtures and concerts. There is no memorial to the more than 300 people who lost their lives there in 1964, nor any further progress towards another inquiry or investigation. A great deal of uncertainty remains surrounding one of the worst disasters in the history of football.